uh, uh, it's being recorded. Okay, cool. So, uh, small introduction uh, about uh, what we're going to do today. So, uh, I want to talk about how to use uh, large language models in production, how to build applications with them, and show you how you can do it yourself, give you a few examples. And yeah, and basically talk about things that I'm doing for the last half a year. And uh, interesting fun fact about this presentation, almost all the images AI generated, so some of them are funny, but I just decided to take it as a challenge and see how far I can get with it. So you will see. So first of all, uh, who am I? Uh, some of you might know me. Uh, my name is Boris Uli. Uh, I'm backend and platform engineer for the last like 10 years. I really like different hype tech, uh, all the new things that are uh, popping up everywhere. I like to try them. I like to tinker with them. I like to build some interesting things. Uh, this way I got into Go uh, like six, seven years ago uh, from Python uh, and I use it still uh, since then. Uh, I uh, really like uh, before that I was uh, really into Python. I used it a lot. Uh, then I switched to Go, spent six or seven years there, and now I'm slowly switching back a bit to Python and using a co combination of those two languages. Uh, my life mod motto is better sorry than safe. So run fast, break things, and then like then fix whatever is broken. So this is why it's got me. Uh, this way it's got me into all those fun things, and uh, I really really proud of this uh, of this approach. Uh, small disclosure, I am not AI or ML expert. I will not be able to explain the difference between median or uh, average. I, I'm really bad in data science. I just know how to tinker things. I, I know how to put them uh, together and, uh, and I know how to build things that people like to use like from product side. Uh, and yes, uh, my experience uh, during the last uh, six months is I built uh, three, four, five, some number of different uh, applications using LLMs that are being used right now in production and a small startup with image generation. So I'm kind of into it, but I don't know how it works, but I'm glad to share with you those things that I know as that I can give to you so you can just take and start using it like from, from, from almost nothing. So uh, agenda for the day. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about LLMs uh, in style, in style explaining like M5. So I'm going to make it as simple as possible, this practical example that we're going to run, and I will share code with you so you can uh, take it yourself, you can change it, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and in the, in the end, uh, we'll have a QA session. Please hold your questions to the end because I have a lot of slides. I removed a lot of things that I want to talk about. I try to dry it as much as possible and probably I will run out, run out of time. But we can always go, can go, can go back to previous slides. You can ask your questions and I will be really glad to, uh, glad to do it. If I can answer again, I'm not an expert in the field. I just know how to put things together and deploy them to production. So let's start. So first of all, I think quite important to know uh, where this all uh, thing started. Uh, with LLMs, uh, generative AI, transformers, things that you might hear before. Uh, in 2014, uh, Beijing University uh, proposed an idea of uh, attention mechanism in uh, deep learning models that, uh, that basically proposes idea of treating uh, machine learning models as our brain works. Uh, we never think about this, our entire brain about some, some things. We use only fractions of our brain to process some small things. Basically, this is the idea behind those transformers, uh, tr tr transformer architecture. It was proposed in 2014. In 2017, it, uh, it got, uh, uh, I don't remember who, who got uh, hands to, uh, on it. And from 2017, it's kind of started rolling and people started building things using it. Nowadays, you can see uh, quite quite a lot of different uh, products built with it. Uh, most popular of them, uh, probably ChatGPT. Most of you tried it. Most of you have seen how it's used. You've heard about it. Uh, it's it's a group of LLMs, large language models. Uh, basically, it's a huge model that knows how to have the complete text, and you can talk with it. Exam some examples are OpenAI or if you want a vendor solution for production deployment, it's Azure AI, pretty much the same, but you need to struggle with Azure, which is 
Okay, but you have predictable resources. Uh, Lama 2, uh, Facebook uh, implementation of LLM with a focus on running it uh, on consumer grade uh, devices. Uh, Vertex AI, it's implementation of GC from GCP. So you can go to GCP, deploy your own Vertex AI uh, LLM and use Palm 2 model with it and basically build sim similar things that you build with OpenAI, but in GCP and Anthropic. This one is a unicorn. They they offer interest like big context. They offer super smart models. They offer many 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 things. But in the end, it's all private beta, and no one knows how to try it. So looking forward to it. But I decided to mention it because guys are really like doing a lot of promises on the market. Uh, in terms of image generation, you probably heard about Dali. It's the first one again from OpenAI, quite cool one. Uh, they announced Dali 3, the newest uh, image generation model. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to it. Uh, Mid Journey, one of the best right now in terms of quality of generation and uh, details in a picture. And Stability AI, uh, stable diffusion model from Stability AI that focused on generation or on consumer grade devices. So, it's possible to run it even on MacBook with M1 or M2 processor. So if, you, uh, if you're into it, I recommend trying it. And audio, audio is probably uh, the least developed uh, part of all those trans transformer networks because there was uh, audio to speech uh, implementation of Whisperer, which is amazingly good. It understands everything, all the, all the mumbling, all the uh, noise, it's, it's just, who hears what, what you say and writes it to the text. Like perfect, super optimized, super small, uh, amazing piece of tech. And speech uh, to text. Um, I would say out of those, and not speech to text, text to speech as a way around. Uh, I would say out of those, speech to five, probably the most, the best ones that you want to look into. And the rest are proprietary and closed sourced. So this is a bit of overview of what is happening there. There are like three different categories with a lot of with a lot of different models inside, and this list is very limited. But if you want to look into it, if you want to tinker with it, I recommend you start from this list. It's probably quite enough to get your own understanding about what you want, what you don't want, what you where you want to go with it. But today we are going to focus only on large, large language models. Uh, what it is, what it, uh, how it works, and how to use it. Not much about how it works, but how to use it mostly. Uh, so first of all, uh, LLM, uh, LLMs is just a type of deep learning models that are trained on huge data sets uh, of text, on books, on Wikipedia, on emails, on forums, on chats, on everything, everything, everything. Uh, it was trained on the way how people communicate with, between each other, on the text uh, that we have everywhere, basically. Uh, so the same way as we train ourselves reading books and reading articles and so on, that model was trained pretty much the same way. It lacks some analytic uh, analytics in it, but it's quite smart in terms of like, after completion and generation of the text. Uh, it's again based on transformer architecture, and there are two quiet uh, there are two separate types of uh, language models. Uh, if you want to use them, if you want to play with them, if you want to do something, you need to understand what you uh, like, what your approach would be. First one is completion based. Uh, think of Copilot. If you write code, you say a func, name of the function, and then it proposes you like 20, 30 lines of code uh, by the name of this function. It's completion. It knows what should go after it. Uh, Tab9, Copilot, some uh, Llama models, uh, those are completion models. And in struct models, uh, those are LLMs that expect you to tell it what to do. So interaction is based not on the comp uh, not directly on the text completion, but on commands. You say like, okay, as, uh, as um, support engineer, please uh, answer me this question, or do this, or do that, or find the best solution, or something, something. So you provide instructions uh, in kind of imperative way, and it gives you answers. Uh, nowadays, if you go and you try different open source models on Hugging Face or uh, whatever, probably all of them will have two different releases. Uh, one is completion, and another one is struct. They always release together. I don't know how how they uh, how they train so they're like different. I would uh, I would assume that is 
uh, result of uh, fine tuning after the model model was trained. But uh, there are two, and you just need to know because, like, if you, if you just take your instruct uh, prompts and you put it into completion model, it will return a completely different. It will just it will just like continue in your instructs, but in, in its own uh, way with all the hallucinations. So you need to understand this before you start using either of them. But if you go to some simple thing as chat GPT, it's instruct, you just go and do whatever you want. So it's simple. And ah, one more thing to mention, like to, to simplify it a lot, what is large language model? It's a, just a huge complex after complete. That's it. Whatever you see after complete uh, in, uh, in your, on your phone when you type something, it's 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 language model. When you see it in a mail, it's language model. When you see it in code, it's language model. In this case, it's just quite huge, and that's why it solves more problems because it's seen a lot. Okay, let's go next. Uh, use cases where LLMs can be used. Uh, from what uh, I've built. I can name a few quite distinct use cases that people uh, that people want to use it or benefit from it, or where actually, like when it's implemented in a product, users are using it a lot. So first of all, it's the most obvious one. Probably a lot of you used it. Summarize. If you want to, if you have a huge article and you don't want to read, don't want to read it, you just copy it into GPT and say like, hey, give me like TLDR of this uh, article in like a few sentences, and that's that's basically the case. It can do it for his uh, chat history. It can do it for books, for articles, for anything. Uh, we uh, implemented it for one of the support projects uh, when uh, agents rotate all the time. There is twenty four seven support, and uh, each new agent needs to know what happened in this conversation with this particular customer before. So this summarization is very helpful to show uh, to show like small uh, summary of. Like of what's happening and cust uh, customer satisfaction rate was just like bumped a lot because all the agents uh, are reading the summary much better than uh, scrolling through, through all the history. Uh, second one, automation. Uh, for example, API integration or topic research after, uh, done automatically. Uh, API integration, I will show you a small example of it today, uh, but I will show you a sm small fraction of it. But uh, long story short, you have some API, you have your own data. You can just take LLM and say like, hey, here's what we want to integrate with what we want to integrate. Please do the mapping for me. And it will be smart enough to, con uh, to connect the fields and uh, prepare all the code for you. It's a quite, uh, quite a valid use case and it's very useful in companies that do a lot of integrations. For example, some service providers that uh, aggregate uh, different, uh, different systems. It's like very popular there. And the second one, probably my favorite one is uh, automatic research. Because like I'm like I'm my, my attention span is super short. I, I cannot focus on topics. I uh, like I'm really bad at researching things. But I can write a bot. Will give it uh, will give it a prompt and it will go searching for new things again and again and again and again. Basically uh, spinning in a loop endlessly until it finds the results that I want or which is like considered quite okay. And I stop it. Uh, third one is chatbots. Uh, chatbots, uh, you've seen them on the sides, on the uh, on the on the right uh, in the right corner of all the sides. There's sometimes pop up saying like, "Hi, how can I help you?" I'm like this AI uh, intelligent uh, thing that, 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 that can provide something. And every time you type there, and it's completely useless and sends you to a real legend. In like nowadays, those things are getting smarter. LLMs are being integrated there intensively. Sometimes you might be connected to an agent and talk to an agent and get real response. But in the real life, on the background, there will be only LLM. An agent will, uh, will jump into the conversation only in case if something goes terribly wrong. And then LLM can connect you to, to real engine and you will not even see it. So this is a really, really valid, valid use case. Uh, and uh, the last one, um, uh, advanced embeddings. Uh, LLMs uh, see a lot of code. Uh, since a lot of text, code, uh, information, and they're quite good in generalizing things, uh, generalizing in terms of embeddings. I will talk about embeddings later. What it is, how to use it, and what like how to how to uh, build a mental picture of them. Uh, so LLMs allow you to make quite good embeddings that allow you to combine or uh, 
or change or compare text uh, and comparing to what we had before these simpler models, that's like just a new level, completely new level. You will see it in my example today. Uh, and before we jump into explanation of uh, embeddings and all the things, uh, I want to talk, it's like about, it's a bit step aside. I want briefly talk about LLM patterns. Uh, we are not going to touch it today, uh, but we, do, we in work daily separate every task and every application in those kind of four groups. When we discuss uh, a new project that we want to implement, we first define, okay, it's, if it's like form formatted output or action loop or full-blown retrieval or augmented generation. So this is quite important. And if you go online, you search for them, you will find uh, information to, to basically continue with it. So first of all, embeddings. As I mentioned already, it allows you to take any piece of text or word or sentence or book or anything and make uh, a simple representation of, uh, of this content in one uh, easily, uh, easily processable value, basically string, uh, array of uh, different flows. Uh, and it's useful when you want to do combination or comparison of things, but more on it later. Second one is formatted output. When you talk with LLM, not like just chat, like, hey, how are you doing? What to do with this? What to do with that? Not, not this kind of uh, communication, but when you want it to make decisions for you, like decisions that uh, people usually do. We call it formatted output. Formatted output because we say it, okay, you will receive data in this specific, in, uh, in this specific format. Usually it's JSON because JSON works the best. Uh, and you have to return it in this specific format, probably as well JSON or YAML or anything that we, uh, that we requ uh, request. And then you can input data in, uh, like you can marshal data in the in this format. You can unmarshal data from response uh, from this uh, in this format, and you can put it as a part of your application. So it's it's a very very important uh, building block of every uh, every LLM. And uh, some of you might heard of uh, GPT, uh, OpenAI GPT adding functions. It's kind of the same. It allows you to uh, assign different functions and uh, get formatted output automatically. But we've tried it a couple of months ago and it didn't work. So we're still staying on our own formatted output templates. It just works. It's a bit more expensive in terms of tokens, but it, it just works. Uh, next one, action loop also known as uh, action sort observation. It's where it's, it's this pattern is very useful when you uh, when you are limited by size of context or you have uh, many, many different operations and you cannot define it, define it in, one, in one simple prompt. Uh, it's useful, for example, for research. You say like, okay, I want to know something about baking cakes. And uh, LLM would say, action, search some article about baking cakes. Uh, and you return this data, you, you parse this input, uh, you execute this function, you return data to, to LLM. And then LLM takes the data that you're giving to it and does the next action and says like, okay, I need more information or I need a uh, description of this, I need a description of that. So basically then LLM acts an uh, flow executioner. It's basically uh, constantly, uh, constantly runs in a loop and knows what the next step is. And your, uh, your uh, work is just to provide it correct information in the correct format. Uh, and the last one is retrieval or meta generation. Basically, previous uh, action loop that I described is also retrieval or meta generation, but uh, we put rag, I will just call it rag because it's simpler. We put them in a separate uh, category because then we involve the database. In some cases, you uh, want to give information to LLM and you want to allow it to search something, but you don't want, like if, for example, you work uh, with entire book or huge uh, document, you don't want to feed LLM with, uh, with this document over and over and over again. You can just put it into database and then allow it searching with embeddings, basically with those hidden uh, indexes. Uh, so it's, it's like the most advanced one. And if you noticed, each next one is based on previous one. So it's not like exclude, like it's not, not like separate patterns that you never mix together. No, they're, they're all mixed together, but it's easier to think of them in terms of complexity by uh, categorizing them in those four, four groups. Okay, uh, now back to the topic. Let's talk about embeddings. I mentioned them a lot of times and it's hard uh, to talk about them, not explaining what it is. 
So let's uh, play this example. Uh, let's imagine that we have a matrix. Uh, we have like this matrix with only one dimension, and this dimension will be color. Colors will be red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, purple. And we like we, we act as natural intelligence. And we need to uh, put uh, different objects on this chart depending on this uh, on these parameters. First of all, let's put apple. Apple goes on red. Let's put plum. It goes on purple. And then let's put Nisha banana. It goes on yellow. Yes, it's AI generated. That's why it's a good sometimes. But I decided intentionally to keep this one. So now we have uh, a chart, basically a matrix, this one column that allows us to distribute different objects from red to purple, depending on their color. What it gives us? It gives us that banana is closer to apple than to plum, which is not really useful for my formation, but in some cases it might be useful if you do something color specific, but okay, let's, let's keep it there. Now let's add second uh, dimension. Let's add size. And when we add size, we can put objects, we can add watermelon, and we can uh, put them on uh, two dimensions. And then it's a bit more distributed. We can say that uh, a banana is, uh, is closer to uh, watermelon than to plum, but the closest to the apple, whatever. And now imagine we start adding those dimensions. Not one, not two, not three, not hundred, thousand. Thousand different dimensions, thousands, probably millions of different dimensions. With each and every dimension meaning new thing, meaning color, shape, weight, um, distance from you, uh, position, anything, anything, anything that you come up, uh, can come up with and you cannot even imagine something. So that's basically how uh, LLMs uh, or different uh, deployment models, imagine this space of objects inside. So like every, everything that uh, a ML, uh, ML model can, uh, can imagine or can think of or can, uh, I cannot even come up with a good word to say, to say can, can put, can classify in these terms, can put in this chart. In other cases, two dimensions, but in terms of LLMs, it can be much bigger. What it gives us? It gives us a very, very predictable uh, value to work with. So imagine you have a uh, LLM or image generation model or anything, and you can feed it some information and to say that this image is close to this text or this audio is close to this text, or this text is close to this text, or those books are uh, close enough in the space, they're, they're relative somehow. So this is what embedding is, the position inside this uh, vector space with many, many, many dimensions. This multidimensional matrix called tensor, you might have heard of it before, and it's usually represented with a fixed size array, this values. It can be integers, it can be floats, usually it's just floats, and you can play with precision changing the floats. Uh, why those are useful? As I mentioned, like you have this, imagine this like multidimensional huge space with all the pos possibilities, and you can put into it anything, and you can see how similar they are, or how different they are, or how, uh, and what, or for example, what's in between. If you, for example, put uh, I don't know, tree and green in between, you will have leaf because it's probably between those two, it's the most obvious thing in this uh, vector space. But tree, leaf, and green, kind of three different things, but it's possible to represent them in the simple matrix in one place. And uh, what, is, what is also good, it allows you to do transformation. If you, for example, put uh, if you, for example, put uh, text and image and audio in one space, you can insert them and you can get them out, basically in the same way as uh, as, as with the same type. So if, if you've seen about uh, if you've seen those like uh, image generation models, text to image, you can write a prompt and you can get image output, and this will be done basically through embedding in this huge model in between. Uh, in, in this 
uh, tensor in between, all the text will be translated into some position, and this position will be translated into image, audio, video, or whatever. So this is a very, very simple explanation of what is happening there, but it's good for you to, to understand uh, embeddings as a thing, because if you start working with all lamps, you will hit those every time and everywhere. It's, 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 there. it's just like one of those sm small building blocks. But to simplify it, think of it as indexes. And now, after all this theoretic stuff and voodoo, let's go to a simple, kind of simple real world scenario application. Here's a QR code. You can scan it. You can uh, play with the application yourself. You can uh, tinker with it, do whatever. It's on GitHub. It's open. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, I will share presentation later so you can scan it later or do whatever later if you don't have time enough now. And uh, let's jump to the code. Okay, we're here now. So uh, what I've built here, I've built a small application that allows us to do easier API integration. So uh, here I have two files. One is example of product. Chris, uh, could you help, uh, sorry, sorry for interruption. Mm -hmm. Could you please make this a little bit bigger? I'm not sure that whether yeah. all will yeah, see sure. the Oops. Yeah, just a couple of times. Nice. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I have here two examples. One example of a product. I just went on the Shopify site to their Swagger definition examples and I copied this example from there. Uh, it's just some dummy data from, from them. And another one is customer. So we have those huge JSONs with a lot of fields, with a lot of nested values, with a lot of really, really confusing things. And imagine our task is to do integration, is to find fields that are matching our API into those documents, what we can match, uh, what we can match there. Uh, to simplify the processing, I uh, processed it a bit and put into those text files as JSON passes. Here I use dots. So it's product with dots, basically all the JSON passes, and here with spaces instead of dots. But those are basically the same fields. You can test them uh, as you've seen in the JSON. Now, in my script, I just in uh, in my script, I just open this file, I iterate over the uh, all the values, and I go to OpenAI and I say, hey, let's generate some embeddings. And I use other models that is used for uh, all the uh, OpenAI uh, open uh, language processing models. So basically those uh, embeddings that I generate here can be used with GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. So it's basically the same thing. And I run this loop endlessly for uh, for every term that, that we have here in the file uh, that we had in JSON, and I save embeddings into simple CSV file uh, here. One for product and one for customer. And here we can already see that each term that we have has this array of floats, huge array. If you go to the end, there are a lot of them. I don't even know how many symbols, but uh, my, uh, my work environment start lagging a bit. Uh, this is basically an embedding. This is what you see here, fixed size array of floats that represents position in a space. So first dimension, second dimension, third dimension, fourth dimension, and so on and so on and so on and so on. And all of those embeddings have exactly the same size which is very useful when you want to do some mathematical operations with them or compare them or anything. So uh, for you to uh, see how this thing works, first of all, I will regenerate, uh, I will regenerate embeddings for customer. It's a bigger one. If you run it, you see that it goes pretty fast. I run, I think, 10 routines in the same moment, but it responds very fast. And generation of embeddings is very cheap. It's like dirt cheap. Like it will, like all the full runs that I had, it will take me a couple of months, a uh, couple of bucks maximum. Uh, but it's very useful. And uh, I recommend you, if you do something with OLMs, use them all the time because it allows you to then do some corrections. So first we generated for uh, uh, consumer. Now we can do it for product. 
basically the same thing, but uh, less fields. And now we have those defined and updated. Uh, so generation is done. And the second thing is find. So this is the interesting part of it. So now we have CSV files with terms and uh, embeddings that can be used to, to compare things. I load them into memory and then I iterate over them, just comparing them to embedding of the, uh, of the search term that we have. So let's go for it. Uh, let's go find, and I've done some tries before. Uh, let's go this, yeah, let's go this size again, doesn't matter. So what I do here, I'm saying execute find command for product document, this one that we see here. And I want to find something that is similar to size. If you run it, what happens now? We, first of all, uh, we go to OpenAI and say like, hey, give me now embeddings for size, for word size. And it'll give me again the same exact list of uh, fl uh, floating values. Uh, floating point values that I can compare against things that I have uh, in the system. And here you can see that what it gave me. It gave me from all the fields here, it gave me the most relevant is images, then image height, then title, then width, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, and here, uh, by the way, score means distance. The smaller the distance is better, but maybe it's a bit wrong. But here you see, somehow it knows that size is relevant to images. It doesn't, it doesn't know. I would expect it to be honest to give me variants because usually in fashion tech, uh, they use variant as, uh, as a way to, to categorize colors and sizes. But in this case, it gave me, uh, gave me images. Let's try something else. Let's go, for example, to customer. Run size again. Size gave me number, gave me name, gave me currency gave me phone, so gave me some generic things, but on top is number, which is quite okay, good. Let's go for email. For email, okay, it's giving me some weird results. It's demagods. <laughs> uh, those shouldn't be here, it's not sorted. No, those are completely wrong values. And this one is really far. Okay, let me regenerate uh, customer data again. That's what happens all the time. Like, like every time we build something, every time we do something, then uh, yeah, you see, now it's perfectly fine. All the values are fine, probably some mistake or, or just some hallucination or whatever, I don't know. So uh, what, uh, what happens here? Uh, now we see that uh, we found email term that is close to email field. So apparently somewhere here in those customer fields, we have an email field, which is, which is practically the same. Yeah, here it is. Distance, I would expect to be zero, but for some reason it's like super small, but it's still there. And second one, it finds customer email, which is close, then phone, which is kind of similar way of communication and it finds it there. And then it finds customer verified email. So it gives us most uh, relevant things, not most relevant, the closest things it can think about in terms of this uh, vector space uh, that we are using here. We can play with other things. We can play with uh, tags or price. Let's see what we have for price. Currency, subtotal price. So it has some relevant total price. So it has some, uh, some relevant results there. Now, what is going on here and how are we getting those values? So again, I said we have, uh, we have a file with all the embeddings for every term and we have embedding for the search terms that we have. Uh, in our function, what I do, I just take all the embeddings, I iterate, over each one of them, and I calculate its distance to one uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the terms that we are searching for. And the distance that I'm uh, calculating here uh, is called L2 distance. You might have heard of it. There are different risk assigned distance. There is uh, the, there are several ways of uh, doing comparison within this vector space. Uh, but I pick L2 distance because it's just easy to implement. You can think of, of it as uh, Euclidean 
distance. Uh, if you remember from uh, from the school, this a square plus uh, b square, or even even Copilot knows about it. Uh, a square plus b square equals c square. This is basically L two distance. It's a fancy way for data science people to call uh, to, to call Euclidean distance. L2 distance. But in this case, we have many dimensions, as you can see. So I just like iterate over all of them, add all of them, and then square rooting uh, the, the result. That's it. That's basically the same simple math that you had in school, but apply it to generalized values from LLMs. So there is this magical LLM that categorizes things, and then your code that can uh, do uh, do all the kind of things where I visit. And here, this example shows similar things, find similarities. But another thing, as I mentioned, you can find, you can make combinations. You can give it email, you can give it phone, and you can see what's in between. Or you can give it price, you can give it size, and see what's in between. So those kind of things. Uh, OK, that's it with the code. Uh, kind of, it's there, use it, try it, break it, whatever, I don't care. It's just like uh, interesting, play, uh, interesting place to start for you if you, if you never touched it. Uh, and now a bit of overview of what happened here. So first of all, we prepared the set. We, uh, of all the fields that we have, our known vocabulary in this case is list of fields from Shopify API. Uh, we calculated embeddings for them and we saved it into our data storage CSV file. Uh, then we took time that we search, we calculated its uh, embedding, and we put all of those things, let's say, on the huge vector space. Like if you think about only three dimensions, what happened here, we put all the terms and all the fields that we have in the uh, cons uh, consumer or product API from Shopify, and we compare it to our search field. And this lower distance thing that we found there was our result. So it's nothing more than just comparison of things in like in the field. And more advanced uh, models you have, uh, smarter, advanced, I don't know, more specialized, I would probably use, uh, use here, then better results you will get. Because all the models that you might use, they will have their own problems and their own specialities. Because uh, all the models uh, trained on different inputs, on different data, on different uh, use cases, it's like, Every time, uh, every time you use a new one, it's like it's, it's just a surprise. But in this case, we have OpenAI because it's easier to use. You can plug in everything and anything and try. My favorite one for this kind of things is uh, multilingual E5. Uh, you can go and Google it. It's quite uh, quite an easy to run model. You can deploy it automatically in Hugging Face. It's prepared there, and it gives more accurate results than uh, OpenAI. Uh, does but OpenAI is quite general, so it supports more, more use cases. Now, uh, about using LLMs in real world in applications, if you want to actually build something with them that is not just tinkering uh, around, but actually building something useful, first of all, pick the right model. Here's a QR code, uh, you can scan it and go to the site of, uh, of a guy who creates comparison of many, many, many different LLMs but not in a table way where you can just see number and pick the one in the top, which is, can be useful for someone, but not really useful, for, was never useful for us. Uh, but he gives different types of examples, says, okay, generate a piece of code, generate uh, something from schema, uh, answer this question, do this mathematical uh, challenge, do this, do that. And uh, there are many, many, many questions and answers to them. So you can go and you can scroll uh, through them and find what actually matches your use case the best, and then start testing uh, those LLMs. So it's very useful if you want to use something on your own, but you don't want to rerun all the models uh, every time. Second one, fine tuning is not realistic. It's quite, it might be a bit of a popular opinion, but from what we've built, it's never worth the time. You can take models for, for example, in OpenAI, you can fine tune them. You can take uh, self-deployed models and fine tune them. You can uh, train them better on your specific use case. But the problem is this, that amount of time that is spent on uh, updating and fine tuning models is not proportionally, uh, it's, it's not proportional to the 
time you will spend uh, to, to, to the money you will spend on it. So basically training and preparing a good model for your use case is more expensive than taking a general model and just paying a bit more for it. So we have in our, uh, in our system several models that are like super well optimized and fine tuned and we run them for uh, named entity recognition for in, uh, for intent for um, uh, how it's called uh, sentiment uh, sentiment analysis for classification so we have different models that do different things and we run them on CPU in lambda because they're like super well well optimized for small use cases but in most cases it's not realistic we just go to huge LLM and we run it there so think twice about fine tuning something it might not pay off in the in the future uh next one you will probably need python in, in production so we use go everywhere so our main uh no, not main rule but our uh rule in the company to use go for everything that we build just because it's typed just it's just because it's uh, runs fast and it's uh forgives a lot of a lot of mistakes but if you want to communicate with LLMs, probably you will need to uh, to run some Python, or you want to run your own models. Probably we need some Python. You cannot get away with it without it. Uh, but what you can do, you can just wrap whatever you want to run in Python, create some API, gRPC API, whatever API you prefer, and communicate with it from Go. In some cases, if you use LLMs as a service which is totally valid use case, like RDS, everyone uses RDS and not deploying Postgres nowadays, right? So this is actually the case. You can just go and use it from, from, from Go code directly. And that's what we prefer most of the time. But if you feel brave, go ahead. There are bindings, Go Torch library, which didn't work for us in the end. And uh, there are some simpler, simpler uh, language uh, processing uh, models with Vego. You can go and try it as well, but we didn't get any good results and, uh, and we stopped trying. There is also some implementation in Rust that I know people uh, hype a lot because it's like super, super flexible and works well, but we didn't have anyone who knows Rust, so we didn't, we didn't try it. So I'm not mentioning it here. Uh, yeah, if you want to extend LLM with, uh, with some database and you can uh, give it uh, some extra data or extra input, you don't need to go with vector database. You don't need to pick any specific database. You know, there are like now hundreds of them, different popularity, different age, all the fancy and good and cool and solve all the problems for everyone. But most of them are really fresh and really young. They're not solving all the use cases that you need in production. So my advice, if you want to do some vector search, you can implement it anywhere. There are plugins, even in ClickHouse. ClickHouse completely not, not for, like it's bad database for this use case, but even they have support of vectors. So you can implement it there if it's the only choice you have. You can go always with Postgres, you can always go with Elasticsearch, this well-known database that's there on the market for a long time and you will have just less problems in the future. It's probably not that fast, but it's fast enough. In most cases it's just fast enough. And uh, yeah, uh, last one, but not least, don't forget to uh, optimize your solution. Uh, if you think of LLMs uh, on production, it's a different world than LLMs uh, for your site project when you want just to research how to bake a cake or whatever, create a trip for yourself. It's a huge load and you need to be smart about how you search things, how you index things, how you, uh, how to, how to, how you store data, how you not leak data between different tenants if you have uh, such things. So think of the optimizations before ahead, how you, how you sh uh, shard your data, how you uh, use as much as possible conventional indexes that are implemented there and optimized really, really well. For example, if you have multi-tenants, just filter it by tenant first and then all the vector search inside, even if you need to pull it into memory and then back, in some cases it might work better. It depends on the amount of data that you have. So think about it. It's it's really, really important because when scale hits, you don't have time to fix it. You will need to know it before ahead. Okay. And yeah, last word, do it. Just go for it. Like if you want to, if you don't know where to start, where to start, you want to try something, you just go to the go to It's it's good enough just to put some uh, get some uh, good feeling about what it is and probably you will come up with some idea. Chat GPT. Same, use it. Subscribe for paid uh, 
paid subscription, go to the platform openai.com and use it there because they have a separation on user prompt, the same system prompt, and you can come up with ideas there. It's like really, really available and it's super cheap. Like you will not spend like 20 bucks there if you just want to try. Like 20 bucks is like you need to try really a lot. Uh, Hugging Face, another amazing site. It's just as GitHub, but for models. People uh, publish their models there. They publish the scripts to the, for deployment, and you can, in a few clicks, deploy things there and test them with, with their UIs. So it's another good place to get inspiration for different use cases that you might have. Uh, for production, probably Azure AI or Vertex AI. Use those two. Those two are not good. Like I'm telling you immediately, like this all sync hype with LLMs happened recently. So there are no good stable products. Don't expect anything good. But if you want to at least uh, predictable performance, then go with Azure AI or Vertex AI. Because otherwise, if you use public cloud, for example, public open AI platform, you will hit limits all the time. You will have all the possible problems and it will, it, it will be painful to debug and uh, handling it in code. It's, it's just not fun. Like in some of our projects that we have, we just have retries in the retries in the tries, like three levels of retries just because on some different layers, different uh, different prompts might fail, which is just ridiculous. With Azure UI, you can deploy uh, open AI models with your own hardware. It will be more expensive, but predictable. And with Vertex AI, you can deploy Google models, Palm 2, for example, which is a bit stupid comparing to open AI, but with good amount of prompting and experiments, it can solve the task. So we have implemented almost everywhere, both uh, OpenAI and Palm 2 uh, models. Palm 2 requires more uh, more work, but both of them will work. So you can use them. In terms of resources, you, you will not be limited. And yeah, if you want to host your own personal uh, projects, use Replicate or Modal. Those two are the best in terms of cost and easy, to, uh, easy of use. Replicate is a bit outdated, but they are there for a long time. So there is a lot of support and a lot of data that you can find. And Modal, they're just like a new kid in town. They come up with this approach of uh, integration in Python. So you just wrap things in Python. Uh, I don't remember how it's called. Basically function wrappers. And it knows what function should be executed in, uh, in and where. And it's like, it's, it's super easy to deploy, super easy to test. So go for it. And yeah, and both of them quite cheap. Modal probably is the cheapest one even. Okay, that's all I had. Now, questions. I see there are some messages in chat, but I didn't look into it. Uh, it's okay, we just discussed and maybe it was one question about uh, possible uh, try when you demo your project and how you use embedding uh, query with amount. Uh, I just I just run the same uh, the same product with amount, uh, same, same query with uh, amount term. You know, this. Yeah, I, I have no idea what we expected to do. Uh, yeah, what we expected don't. to get. But let's let's run it. Currency and number total price uh, subtotal price. Okay, it kind of relates it to price somehow. But again, currency wins almost in all cases. And then product. I think I need to rerun it again for product. Customer was run. Uh, yeah, was and uh, why you think it's the reason uh, that the embedding was calculated and you need to rerun it? Uh, because it will sound stupid. I'm like 10 years in this industry, but just if it's not working, just restart it. That's what I learned during the last half a year working with all lamps. Most of the time, okay. it's just like, just fucking restart it. Like there, there is no good answer. Like I have, like I have a list of bugs that I, that I was chasing for days, and just like you just you regenerate it or you retrain it, or and then it just works, and you don't want to know. So in most of the cases, like problem with LLMs, uh, why 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 this is why? Okay, a bit technical explanation of why it might have happened. There is a, there is a thing as hallucination. Like uh, all the LLMs, they work all the uh, models in general. They work with floating point numbers. And when you do calculations with those, you have errors. If you remember, they're like, that's like plus zero one, uh, zero one plus zero two, it will give you zero three, zero, 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 four. 
So you have this, uh, I don't remember how this uh, fraction mistake called, but you have it all the time. So that's why those hallucinations might happen. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was a reason here, or I just executed something wrongly. So this just happens. Some cases you just need to run it, stabilize it, and ship it, and then it's fine. Yes, and could so, it clear for me maybe some other questions? Guys, yeah, don't, don't be shy. Yeah, you can write down some questions. Yeah, guys, ask questions. Like, I'm, I'm dumb. I'm not, I'm not pro in this uh, thing, but I can at least uh, answer you some questions that I, like, learned. I just, like, it's, it's, it's try, fail, try again cycle. So go for it. So uh, you've mentioned you worked with a uh, chatbot. Is it correct? Yep. Uh, uh, well... Uh, have you had uh, some like complex conversation? So, uh, do you have uh, your own framework for it, or you've just used uh, some um, lags from AWS or something like that? That's a really good question. We experimented with different frameworks in the beginning, uh, and in the end, we just wrote our own. Uh, those frameworks kind of very useful when you want to try small things in the beginning and those frameworks give you out of the box a lot but when you start working with it in production you hit all the problems and all the errors and all the imperfections let's put it like this there so it's in the end was much cheaper to write our own prompts and our own uh, action loops so we have our own package that we maintain where we implemented standard uh, prompt for all the action loops that we have we have at least up to 10, up, up to 10 different action loops with different use cases for different uh, actions, but we use exactly the same package and we barely maintain it. So I would say go and implement your own because with libraries, we spend really more time just fixing it and finding why something was wrong inside. Oh, okay, thank you. And also, like, what about testing? So I, I believe testing this stuff is just painful. a thing. Yes, it's painful, but uh, we actually, uh, today we released an RFC about how we plan to do it. And for now, uh, give a second, I know that uh, Microsoft uh, on their GitHub have a framework for it. Uh, it's not something that will solve everything for you. It's not as simple as you will write tests uh, from, from flow. It's not something that uh, you can use and run just like, if you need to test it is go, go test and everything will be executed. No, but at least it gives good examples on how to build those things. You can write in your own language because this one is written in Python. But yeah, there is no good way to do it for now. And the best thing that we come up with, uh, we wrote a small script that we execute now. We wrote a small script that uh, we feed with our prompt templates filled with different uh, different you know, inputs and different values from users or different data. And then we uh, run uh, those prompts against different models. Those results then we feed feed to GPT-4 and we say, okay, now from zero to 10, grade this uh, response according to this uh, to, according to this request. Was it valid, wasn't it valid? Things like this. And then it at least helps us to catch some regression, but still it's not, not even close to what I would want, but yeah, that's all we have. So I can share it in chat as well. Great, thank you. Any other questions, guys? We know that it's too late for us. Somebody already <laughs> go on <laughs> due to that. Yeah, thank you, Boris, for your time and for your dedication to this topic. It's really amazing to hear from you. I know you was very passionate about our community and make a lot of contribution. Yes. Oh, we have one more question. No, mm -hmm. oh. ah, for me here. Okay, I wonder uh, what output we receive in case we will try uh, our model to guess customers most likely password depending on what data uh, model has. Can you test it? Uh, you mean in the things that I just implemented with embeddings or? 
I'm not really sure what you want to execute. Most like a book also depending on the data model has. It, it, like it's somehow to, to yeah maybe to bring make, make down the password or what? Uh -huh. Maybe it's more about completions. So yeah, like uh, like I see piece of question here about leaking passwords in the models, and yes, it's possible. Uh, those models sometimes, especially open source models that people train on whatever data they find, sometimes may contain some data that you want to be there. Uh, and where it usually gets there from? From your GitHub. Don't push your keys. Don't, don't just, just don't push passwords. Don't push keys. Like don't don't make stupid things. That, that's how it's getting there. And there is it's possible to get it and it's possible to abuse it. Uh, I recommend you to look into DevCon this year. Uh, there were like a lot of people talking about those use cases and how to. There are even special red teams uh, that focus on attacking models and and testing them and finding ways to exploit them in the ways that uh, developers didn't intend to. So it's quite, quite, quite possible. So it's a huge field already and they've been abused all the time.